Hi, everybody. My name is Elizabeth Fawn, and I'm going to be moderating our panel today. It's on the editor and writer relationship for Gen Con Writers Symposium. Thank you so much for joining us. But before I have our guests introduce themselves, I'm going to ask you to please turn in your tickets for this event at GenCon.com. The powers that be need to know that you have an interest so that we can continue providing you with the symposium. Thanks so much. I'm Elizabeth Vaughn. I write fantasy romance novels. I don't edit anything. <laughs> LaShawn, why don't you start us off and introduce yourself? Hi, I'm LaShawn M. Wanick. Uh, I am a writer of short stories, of fantasy, and a little bit of horror. Um, I'm also the editor for Giganotosaurus, which is a short story magazine uh, online. Um, our stories run from 5,000 words to, I think, uh, 25,000. Um, so basically, we go up to novella size. Um, and yeah, we publish one story per month. Tom? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Tom Holler. I'm an editor at uh, Delray Books, uh, uh, which is part of Penguin Random House. Uh, I've been an editor in uh, science fiction and fantasy uh, publishing for about five years um, and have worked kind of across the genre with authors on original works, but also with large companies and brands on licensed books. So like Star Wars or um, Blizzard Entertainment or um, uh, Wizards of the Coast. Gabrielle? I'm Gabrielle Harboy. I uh, I've written short stories and three novels, including a Pathfinder Tales tie-in novel. But I'm primarily an editor. I've been editing in the field for about 15 years. Uh, I was an acquisitions editor at Dragon Moon Press uh, and managing editor for 10 years. And I've also been a submissions editor at Apex Magazine. Jim. Um, I'm Jim Lauder. I started off in the industry in the late 80s uh, as a line editor for TSR, working on uh, the Forgotten Realms and Dark Sun and, and some of the other bigger lines. Uh, from the early 90s, I've been, I was a freelancer for quite a long time. I've edited uh, 20 some odd anthologies, uh, worked for various houses all over the map, uh, and I am currently uh, the executive editor for Chaosium, and that job also includes uh, relaunching their fiction line. Uh, as a writer, I've published five novels, I've done comics, a couple of dozen short stories, uh, role-playing games, all kinds of things. Sounds good. I was thinking we'd kind of start this discussion by defining what exactly the relationship is between a writer and an editor. Um, and I'm, I'm going to kind of pick on Tom first, if that's okay. What do you think of it as? Uh, so I think of it, oh, sorry, the lights just flashed as there's a very cool thunderstorm outside. Uh, <laughs> anywho, um, I kind of think of it as both um, a collaborative storytelling partnership, but broadly speaking, like, it is a close partnership and relationship. Um, the act of storytelling and creating a story um, is such an intricate and challenging uh, endeavor that in order for um, an editor and a writer, I think to do so successfully involves them not just understanding each other's storytelling um, tendencies and capabilities and perspectives, but also understanding like who they are as individuals and people and what sort of perspectives and history and background and points of view that you are bringing into the storytelling process. So. Um, in almost every um, relationship uh, that I've had with a writer, um, spent a lot of time just trying to get to know them, not just in terms of their background or other things that they've written or their, their other sort of professional qualities and sensibilities, but really like what their general worldview is and what, what kinds of things they want to accomplish with their writing beyond just, you know, I would love for the wizard to be able to cast this type of really cool spell, or I'd love for the magic in my story to, to work like this. Um, and to be honest, I have and seek to have as close relationships as I have with, with writers and the, the best books that I think I've done or worked on have been the ones that have had the closest relationships akin to like the close relationships I have in my personal life, um, which sounds like a really daunting thing. That you, um, and in some cases it is, but it just sort of underscores, at least for me and underpins, how kind of um, at times like sacred and important the, the relationship between an editor and a writer is. 
Do you, do you think of yourself as the editor as also an advocate for the writer at the publishing house? Uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, at a publishing house, the person who knows the book best is the editor. So you are not just the central advocate for that book, you are the fulcrum for that book. So everything that's going to happen to that book from a marketing and publicity standpoint, in terms of production, design, you know, copy editing, proofreading, literally anything has to and will inevitably sort of pass through your purview. And you are the fulcrum. You're the person who has to like bring all of those disparate uh, elements together to work in tandem in terms of scheduling and in terms of like, here is our uh, vision for the book. So yeah, you're, you're the internal advocate because if anyone has a question about the book, you're the person who knows it best. You know the the you know you know the plotting the best. You know the author the best. You know what the author wants to um, accomplish with their story. So you're the person who's like the first uh, person who's going to be asked any question, even if it's not really within your normal expertise. Um, absolutely. Well, Sean, does it work the same way for you? <laughs> we have that mute yeah. issue. Yeah. <laughs> um. Sort of, but in a much smaller form. So mm -hmm. because I only publish one story a month, um, basically how it is is I read Slush, find a story I like, and I publish it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's basically the extent of how it is. Um, for me, for me, in some ways, it is a bit of what you asked, uh, what you you said. It's like uh, said Elizabeth, and that I am looking for stories to sort of advocate and champion, um, particularly looking for people whose stories are not often told. Um, but on the other hand, I also there are stories where it will capture me, but it's not quite there yet. And if I really, but if I really, really like it, um, I will offer suggestions on here, you know, here are some suggestions on how you can, you know, make it a bit stronger um, and then come, you know, send it back to me and we'll see how it is. And if I like it, it's actually a way of working with that person, with the, with the writer um, to make their st story as strong as possible so that it is something that people want to read. So there, there's a relationship in that regard. Yeah, Gabrielle? I, uh, I think that part of the relationship involves, I mean, part of advocating for the author is making the author's content come through to the best of the editor's ability, the, the author's intent. Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, I like building rapport with authors. It doesn't always happen. It's not necessary, but I find it helps. I find that once I've worked with an author, I'm champion, championing them in everything they do because, you know, I like their work. I've worked with them. I believe in them. Um, I think there's also a business side to it about keeping an author on schedule. Uh, actually, the reason I joined Twitter many, many, many years ago was because I had an author on a very tight deadline and I wanted to nudge them every time they went to the park instead of working on their edits. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I see you. Yes. <laughs> but you have to have the rapport in order to be able to nudge them in a gentle way and have it take it in kind. So that really helps. You know, there are times yeah. when I can write in the margin busted and, you know, <laughs> We all know what's going on, but with a new client, there's no way in hell I would do that. So the rapport helps. I think it's also, you know, the, the, the manuscript is, the author has a lot of ego invested in that. So it's important that the editor not have ego invested in it. It's not a push pull. It's not a competition. It's not, you know, scoring points as to who gets this sentence their way. Um, yeah. And I've, I, I've often, especially with newer writers, had to really work to remind them of that. You know, you and I are working together for the best story we can possibly tell. I want your vision to shine through. I don't want people to be confused about what you mean. This is just to make your story shine. Yeah. James? Um, 
Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said. Uh, the the way I, I look at it is that the editor's role is to clarify, uh, help the author clarify their vision. That's that's your primary job. And, and how you do that is going to be different with every author you work with. Because some of them want you to offer writing suggestions. They want you to be sort of a, a half a co-writer and, and give them suggestions on how to fix their descriptions uh, rather than just to mark the thing and say, this description needs to be stronger and, and you might go in this direction. Uh, it, you know, theory rather than specific examples. And other authors are going to approach it completely differently. I, and I know a, as a writer myself, I hate being rewritten. Um, I will rewrite all day, every day, uh, based on the notes that the editor gives me. Uh, but I've also worked with writers who don't want to do that at all. They, are, they would much rather have me suggest a word choice change, uh, and then they'll mm -hmm. consider it 80% of the time they'll take it or they'll come up with their own. Uh, but but that's going to be different between uh, every with every writer that you work with, uh, and, and and you can't with assume every project right and, and every project right because they don't necessarily all go the same way. Um, and, and the other thing to to realize about that is every editor is not right for every author. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You're you're going to eventually run into as a writer you're going to run into editors whose style clashes with your own. And you learn what you can from it and you try to try to be constructive, but but don't make the mistake of assuming everybody works the same way. Right. Let's I would uh, add to that, oh, sure. I could, that Absolutely. Uh, not every editor has the luxury of working the way they want to work because mm -hmm. there are also constraints on the project. Yep. And, mm -hmm. You know, some publishing houses, the editor and the author never get to interact. They don't know who their copy editor is. They don't know, you know, who their line editor is. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the way I might want to interact with an author might not be the way I'm allowed to interact with an author. Yeah. And so that's, yeah, and that, that steps it back. That's a great point. That steps it back to the idea that every publishing house isn't necessarily right for every author either because the author is going to want different things out of the relationship. Yeah, yeah. So so basically what we're talking about here is a relationship that's built not just on creativity, but also on the professional business aspect. So let's talk about this writer's favorite thing, deadlines, and how to maintain a relationship with an editor when you run into problems with those deadlines. Anybody got any suggestions? Be honest. Mm -hmm. That's that's the, the fundamental one is be honest and keep communication open. There is nothing that will make a project go from troubled to flaming dumpster fire faster than the author refusing to answer emails or hiding how serious the problem is or, or having issues like that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the simplest thing is like, you can't solve a problem unless you know there's a problem. So right. if an author is communicative with, hey, this is not working, that's fine. We can solve any problem. We'll figure it out. But if if the author never raises their hand or never says, actually, yeah, this is not working. This deadline is not going to work. I'm having this thing going on. Then the rest of the publishing kind of machine, publishing house large or small, like, you know, mm -hmm. we talked about there's all these different departments, like the rest of the publishing train is going to keep heading down the tracks. Um, I realize I'm mixing my metaphors here a little bit, but like, and the author is going to be pulled along the way unless the author says, can we please stop for a second so that we could work this out? So right. yeah. yeah, it's really about open communication first and foremost. Um, and, and all that stress and all that adds stress to the editor's relationship to the project as well. Because they're being asked these questions by other people that they're working the cover artist or the advertising people or whatever size uh, publisher you're working with, there are other people you are working with as an editor, and they're asking you questions about the book. And there's nothing worse than being able than having to say, "I don't know," yeah. uh, and that yeah, creates yeah. all kinds so, of stress. So, if an editor is being an advocate, you also have to respect that the editor is your point person at the publisher and needs 
to meet their deadlines and their responsibilities for all the things that come together to bring a book or a publication to life. Right. Well, Sean, do you have a separate kind of a separate issue because yours is, you know, one story a month. Do you have other issues that you have to deal with uh, authors? Yeah. Um, for me, it's, yeah, it's a little bit different because um, usually um, the time between I accept the, I accept the story and then get it re ready for publication. It's usually, uh, unless the story is very, very long, or, and if it really has some serious, you know, copy editors, uh, copy editing that needs to be done. Um, usually, for me, I can turn, I could turn it out around really quick. Uh, so, mm -hmm. really it's more corresponding with the author. Hey, does you know? So, it. it in cases, you know, such as for me, I have to just make basically make sure that the author is still available to reach, you know, via email. So it's like, hey, you know, here are, you know, some changes, you know. And usually, usually most of the stories that come to me are very well put together anyway. So I barely need to like change a lot stuff, you know, if anything is more typos, you know, formatting, things of that nature. So, yeah. but, um, but yeah, um, I, I use, this is where I usually have a schedule set up in advance. So I'm able to say, okay, here's where your story is going to be published. Here's where I'm going to send you, you know, edits. Usually, if anything, the deadlines are slipped by me because I'm also juggling a day, day job, you know, and right. my own career. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, I'm usually, I sorry, I got this to you a little late. Can you look this over and make sure it's okay? <laughs> well, and that's the, that's the communication part too, is even yeah, as the right. editor, you need to be uh, honest with the authors and say, all right, this is what the, this is causing a delay. This right. is why it's happening and, yeah. and keeping them yeah. in the loop as well. Yeah. Yeah. I have to say when the Corona came, when Corona virus started and everything started shutting down, um, I was actually very grateful that I had several stories already ahead of time because yeah. at the time I couldn't even think straight. Um, but luckily I was at that point. It's like, you know what? These stories are already paid for. I just need to do the edits and go. And that actually helped me out a lot because I had them I didn't have to rush or panic or anything. I you know, I was able to freak out about the work for about a month or so and be like, okay, yeah. get back to work. <laughs> so yeah. so yeah. Gabrielle, just what's the difference when you're dealing with an anthology? Because in an anthology you have multiple authors trying to meet deadlines. Is that any I'm going to use the phrase herding cats because my cat mm -hmm. just zoom bombed our panel. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking that phrase myself, and your cat is adorable. I'm enjoying the, the cameos. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, difficult, uh, it's difficult on the authors. It's, um, you know, the, the first author to turn in their contract wants to announce the, the deal. And you're like, no, you can't do that until everybody has their thing in. But I know different anthologists do it differently. Uh, when at Greenwood and I do anthologies, we don't disclose the table of contents until everybody's contract is in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, you know, the, the, the first person who got it in three months ago says, can I tell people already? I'm sure. going to tell people. And you're like, no, 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 don't tell people. You know, we're glad that you're this proud. Please don't tell people. And you're chasing after that one straggler who's somebody really important and famous that you're terrified to call on the phone. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I try to delay things until people actually have stories in and it looks like everybody's going to be in because there with anthologies, there's always a good 10% uh, breakdown rate with people who are, in, they, they, they want to do the book, but something comes up and they can't or whatever other problem comes up and you don't want to announce them and then have to say, oh, they had to drop out. So, so yeah. let me ask a follow-up to that, Jim. Even well-established authors run into problems, but 
how many times can an author do that to you before they have ruined their reputation with you? Oh, that's a great question. Um, it depends on how it was handled. Uh -huh. um, it, it, oh, it, that it, communication thing? Yep, the communication thing. Uh, the, the first time somebody uh, goes dark on me, they stop answering emails, they hide on social media, they do whatever they're going to do. Uh, that's the last time they do that with me because I don't have time to spend chasing people. Uh, mm -hmm. If somebody has a problem and they're honest with me up front and says, you know, I, I, this is what happened, this is why I can't get it done, uh, and they were professional about it, I don't hold that against them. Uh, and so I've had people that, and, and it works both ways. I've had people that I have dropped from projects because their project, their um, their turnover wasn't going to work. The story wasn't there, or uh, it was not what we had talked about them submitting. And I've had to fire them from the project. Uh, and we try to leave it so that that's not going to mean we don't work together again. Next time, we just need to be a little clearer up front and keep that communication going. And and that's happened. And I've gone on to do several projects with authors. So it's all about communication and professionalism. Absolutely. Tom? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Gabriel, if you want to add something. Um, well, I was just going to say, when, when Ed and I have done anthologies, we've always uh, phrased the invitation as a request for a story for consideration. Yes. And that way we're not locked into contracts with people until we've seen whether the story will fit and whether they'll actually produce a story. And then, so we end up having multiple stages of deadlines and delays, which isn't optimal, but there's always a compromise on one end or another. But again, everybody does anthologies completely differently, but that's the way we, we make sure we're not sending out a contract unless we know we want the story or to, you know, people who aren't going to be able to get us a story so that there's no hard feelings there. Uh, there have been hard feelings at times when people didn't notice that clause in the invitation and thought, oh, well, this is guaranteed. You have to take my story now. <laughs> and uh, that's always been pretty awkward. But again, it's communication. Have, have you run into that with yours, LaShawn, where you've got a story that you want to do, but the author isn't willing to make the changes that you need them to make to, to, to get it that final over the line for you? Um, that hasn't happened to me yet. Um, most of the stories that I usually, when I when I come across a story that I like, but it needs something, I call it a rewrite. I, I actually ask for a rewrite request rather than, you know, a contract. And usually when I do the rewrite request, I always put in, I always put in my emails that this is not a, this is not a, um, a, this is more consideration. It yep. would not be that I will buy your story. It's not um, a commitment. It's not a it's commitment. Not yep. a commitment. Yep. Um, so, and I've already had a couple of people who rewriting their stories and they've gone stronger. Um, and, but there was like a couple of times where, you know, just they need just a little bit more help. So usually I will go back and forth, you know, with the writer and say, let's tweak this, say how this works. And um, that's, yeah. And finally it gets to the point where it's like, this is actually really good. I like it, let's buy it, you know, and then I'll send the contract. Um, there, there, have been, there have been a couple of times where I've been doing that on anthologies where I've had authors say, you know what? I, I completely disagree with that editorial input. And yeah. we had to shake hands and say, okay, uh, good luck selling it somewhere else. I, you know, I uh, wish you uh, all the best on it, but it's not mm -hmm. right for me. Um, yeah, and I've, I've, I've been on the opposite side of, of that um, with the story. Yeah, with one of my stories I've written, um, I actually did re rewrite requests for a story that I've written. And um, it was a lot, there was a lot of the, the the editor took time to say, here's what needs to be changed. And if you do that, I'll consider it again. It was a lot of good, there was a lot of good things he suggested, but also there was a lot of other things that I just didn't agree with. Yep. And so finally, uh, after thinking it over, I was like, I, I can't do this. I'm gonna withdraw my story. And 
they were cool with it. And I, I did take it to the to heart. I actually rewrote, you know, I rewrote a lot of that story. And mm -hmm. that story wound up being bought by Faya. It's my sister Rosetta Tharp of Memphis, Memphis Mini story. Awesome. <laughs> so yeah. And then it appeared in the best of anthology. So fantastic. Just, well, see, yeah. that's and that's that's the lesson to take from it as a creator, right? Is stick to yeah. your guns you know, be able to, and, and handle it professionally as you did with that and be able to say no. And a good editor is going to be able to, to have an author say no and not have it be a personal insult. Yeah. yeah. So I have to tell you that um, as a writer, whenever I get edits on a novel or a short story, my first reaction at looking at those edits are almost always, how dare you touch my perfect butterfly of a book? So I have a rule that I cannot contact anyone for 24 hours about those edits, except certain trusted friends who I can vent to. Sure. Because the second time I open it up, I might be cursing. And then the third time I look at it, I go, oh God, they're right. And so I always make it a, a point never to take the first emotional response to my editor. Having when said I, that, right? Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, I when I uh, wrote my Pathfinder novel, which was my first novel after ten years of being on the editor side of the desk, my editor James Sutter said, "How long did it take before you could look at your edits without yelling at me?" Like he knew. Oh yeah. <laughs> Having said that, how does an author approach an editor professionally to challenge some of the changes that are proposed? Now, having asked that question, I should tell you that every time an editor has touched one of my stories, it's always been an improvement. But there have been times when I kind of stuck to my guns. So how do you how do you do that professionally, Tom? You have to run into this. Oh yeah, especially so, in like Star Wars. Yeah, so there's 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 two there's kind of two pieces to it. Ideally, um, when the editor is going to be making suggestions for changes, they are not just making um, saying like please change this. That they are providing a kind of methodology behind or reasoning behind, so that when you as the writer you say, okay, this person is suggesting this change and they are suggesting it for this reason. So even if you disagree with the change or disagree with the, the specific change or, or the issue, you can at least have an understanding of like, okay, this is the perspective from which the editor has made that suggestion, which then informs the second part and, and your question specifically, which is, well, how do you kind of push back against it? Which is as long as an author is willing to say and explain, you know, I would rather not make this change because X. That's fine. That's We're having a discussion. We're having a dialogue. And ultimately, we may meet in the middle and compromise. And that's where perhaps even the best solution is. Where that can become challenging is obviously if you approach it from just like a combative perspective, that is not going to help anybody. Yeah. Um, and the other, the only other kind of rule I ever have about this that I try to make clear to all the authors I work with is, we can absolutely talk about almost anything. Now, obviously, if we're working on something like Star Wars and you want to like change something like fundamental about how Star Wars works, the answer is probably no, because some of these worlds and stuff have hard walls that you run into. But yeah. broadly speaking, my only other rule is just like if I make a suggestion or if there's an editorial note or comment, I you're not allowed to ignore it. You can absolutely say, you know, I don't want to do that, or I don't really think that's a great idea. Here's why, or can we talk through this? You know, I'm worried this is going to undo X, Y, Z, somewhere else. That's great. Let's have a conversation. That's what editorial, the process is. It's a conversation. It's a dialogue. Yeah. But you can't just ignore it because you don't like it. You, we, we need to talk through. We need to explain because, you know, odds are that you probably are, you might be right as the author. You, you may have this be like, you didn't, did you think of this? And I, as the editor might be like, actually, sorry, I didn't think of that. You're right. That's not a great suggestion. Let's, let's work through, you know, and, and back it up. So really, it, I mean, it kind of, I think we're going to keep coming back to the word communication at the answer, as the answer to almost every question for this panel, but it really is about not approaching it from a combative point of view, but also providing reasoning behind why you do or don't want to agree with a particular notation. Yeah. yeah. And that's the, the deal killer we were talking about 
you know, things that will kill your relationship with your editor, ignoring comments and pretending they're not there just to blow past them is another way to do that because then you're wasting the editor's time. Um, you know, the editor wrote that stuff down for a reason, not just because they felt like they needed to put some ink on the page. And uh, at, at, at worst, at, as, as Tom was saying, that, you know, that should spark a conversation where you find out what the cause was for the comment, where the author says, oh, well, but th this is because this character does that two chapters later. And the editor can point out, well, no, they actually don't. That might be something you think <laughs> The character does two chapters later, uh, but that's in your head as the writer, and it actually never made it onto the page. So you you never discover that unless that conversation happens uh, about why why is the uh, editor asking you for these changes? I do this really diplomatically. I say, uh, please don't just delete my edits or comments unaddressed because then I'll forget that I made them and I will make the same comment most likely when I go through again. That's very smart. I might, I might borrow that. Yeah, that is an extremely uh, smart and diplomatic yeah. way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Because that way it's all on me. It's, you know, I, I won't remember that I made this suggestion. You're just saving yourself some time if you address it. Um, <laughs> it works. From the, author's, from the author's point of view, asking your editor how they want you to deal with these kind of things up front is always a good strategy because mm -hmm. different editors deal with things different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one of the guys that I edited with back at TSR uh, was notorious for going through and drawing lines through 10, 12, 15 pages of a manuscript and writing NB in the margin. Uh, and that was his entire feedback for that part. And NB meant needs better. Um, <laughs> and this would make, as an author, this makes blood shoot from your eyes. And you know what? Um, there were people, and this is the, this was the perspective thing, right? There were people who actually really liked working in those with that editor. That that so to them was enough. They didn't want any suggestion really? how to fix it they just wanted it and they, these were really successful best-selling authors who loved that level of feedback i, I hated can, it i can see that yeah because sometimes and this is this is coming from this from a short story side but yep. um, um this is me as being an editor relatively is new for me um sometimes when you're going through and you're reading a story you just don't know what needs to be fixed. Right. And it just needs to be better. <laughs> and unfortunately, those are actually, those are probably the ones that I probably sit on the longest because I try to figure out, you know, what it is that I don't like about the story. And it just, what you just said there, it just needs to be better. It and just didn't quite like, work for you. Yeah. But, yeah. but don't you think, yeah. That, that if we're talking about the writer's obligations to an editor, the editor also does have an obligation for constructive criticism. Oh, I absolutely. Mean, I got yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Um, I would say for on the writing side, I'm learning that that actually, be, it, it might not actually be the case in that when you reject a story, you want to reject. You want if you're holding it on for that long. You want to. You, you want to have reasons why, but sometimes you just don't. And yep. usually I have a story. Usually, my answer for that is that it just didn't work for me. Right. And one of the things that I need to work on myself um, is around those type of stories better because if it gets rejected, rejected for me, it may not work for me, but it may work for another editor. So getting them out and getting them, um, it, rejection is harsh, but at the same time, it allows you to move on to the next market. And so um, that's on me as an editor. Um, but there are some stories that I actually do know what's going on. And I actually do take time to say, here's why it didn't work. Um, here, here's what needs to be fixed. Um, it's not... I still won't, I'll still reject the story, but it may be something that the author can use so that they can 
fix it and then move on. Sure. Um, it, it, it's a balancing act, um, knowing which to do that for. So. But a, reje a rejection isn't necessarily bad news. I mean, oh, no. and, and, that's, and once you've been doing uh, editing long enough, I, I read uh, uh, Slush, and I'm doing it again for Chaosium, but I read Slush at, at TSR, and there were a couple of books that we rejected, and by the time, after I was about six months into the gig, I realized, you know, part of it is this is a brilliant book, but it's completely wrong for TSR at the time in 1990, because our audience would not value this book and would not support it. And we as a company couldn't sell it because it's it's looking it's it's aimed at a different audience. And uh, a couple of those books that I rejected with those those kind of letters actually ended up at Tor and and other major houses where they were really successful and and that's great. It was actually in the author's uh, best interest that I realized what was uh, you know what the the place of that work would have been in the publishing house. And sometimes the rejection is in your favor. But the um, uh, what kind of edits? Um, so I'm going to kind of pivot a little bit and ask what kind of edits um, you do. Do you do story edits? Do you do um, like, for example, LaShawn, you probably not only do story, but you also do line and copy edits, right? Um. Follow us. Um, for the most part, for me, when I like I said, it, it depends on the story. Um, there there have been some stories that come to me, and they are they've been spell checked, they've been proofed. They're basically I can put them on site as is. Um, so I like those stories. Send me those. <laughs> <laughs> Send me those if you want to, you know, get a leg up. Yeah. Um, but there have also been stories where um, I actually have done actual story, you know, actual story, and a lot of it have to do with you either consistency or um, there'll be a ch there'll be a scene that felt out of place or that needed to be um, elaborated on. So those would be my comments. Um, and I actually would make those comments as I'm reading them in advance so that, um, and like I said, I've only done this like once or twice in, so far as editor, um, where I would actually send it a, maybe a month or so ahead of time saying, let's work on this together. Um, but for the most part, it's more copy edits for me. For the most part. Gabrielle, do you do story? as well as line and copy? Or do you have so, copy editors? I'm a freelance editor, so I do whatever the project requires. Ah, OK. <laughs> so when I was with Dragon Moon, I was doing acquisitions and development and copy editing and the whole thing. Uh, at other publishers at Pyre, I was just doing copy editing. Um, you know, For other authors or projects, I might just be doing proofreading. It, it depends. OK. Tom, I'm saving you for last. James? <laughs> um, I it, Again, it depends on the project. For anthologies, yeah. I, def, I do uh, everything except the final proof. I, I like to have at least one more set of eyes go over a book after I'm done with it, because I know there are things I miss. Uh, but for, the, for um, Chaosium stuff, uh, I'm again, I'm doing, uh, you know, kind of everything short of the final copy edit, you know, the proofread uh -huh. slash copy edit pass. Tom, I'm assuming that, you know, at a main house that you're mostly doing story. Uh, so I do story or like developmental editing and right. I do line editing. Cause obviously if you're, oh, you're reading and engaging with a story enough times, for the story editing, you're going to see line edits and stuff. And I even do um, 
some copy edits, but mainly when it comes to the branded books that I work on, because, you know, if you work on sort of Star Wars or something like that long enough, you learn some of the very specific style guys about like, you know, if you write the word X-Wing, the letter X is capitalized, but the word wing is yeah. not like that. You learn that stuff. And obviously our copy editing team learns those style quirks too, but you work on books like that enough and you sort of just pick them up. Then it's like, naturally, I just start making the corrections as I'm doing my other edits, but then Obviously, I have the kind of privilege to be able to leverage a really wonderful copy editing and proofreading team, which is great because they know far more about the the standards of grammar and style and stuff that I can possibly keep in my head. So um, I do get to help uh, manage those. But a part of your role, if you're not doing that at a large um a large publishing house is like you have to be the person then to kind of connect the copy editor with the author so that if there are questions about like you know did the author actually mean this like they spelled this word wrong a bunch of times that was they doing this intentionally is this is this syntax choice intentional it seems a little strange yeah. you have to actually facilitate that sort of conversation between them um yeah. in terms of getting the queries addressed but yeah it's mostly kind of the line and the the higher level story editing yeah and, I, and I a, lot times, a lot of times no, on those ahead. I've done um, a couple of freelance projects for Ben Bella, and including one that I did last year, year before, on the space program. And that involved, when it, when it went over, they have a very structured, I was only doing the developmental editing part of that. Uh, but when I turned it over to the copy editors, it meant here's a six page uh, word list for how this author uses NAVSAT and all of these other very specialized terms that I ended up researching myself as part of the developmental process. So, so that's as Tom was saying, you know, your job then, if you're working in a in a, uh, a structured uh, tiered environment like that, you are the person who's doing all the communications. Yeah, Gabrielle, can I say uh, the uh, the style sheet of how you use how the author uses words you know, specifically in the manuscript is a great tool that the, the editor will create, but there's no reason the author can't create it and submit it with the yep. manuscript. If you want to be an editor's best friend, that's the thing you can do. I, um, so I'm a hybrid author. I, I'm both New York and I'm also independent. You know, I publish my own. And I will give my editor and my copy editor who I hire a style sheet. And one of the things I say is, these are my major errors. Please watch for them mm. because I do it all the time. I love um, you all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, except the list seems to get longer and longer. Um, but uh, that kind of communication uh, and professional relationship is, is pretty uh, important in terms of uh, dealing with one another. And we all know that sometimes that goes incredibly sour, okay? So I did have a situation when I, um, my agent stepped in and the agent acted as a buffer between myself and the editor on this one particular issue. And um, the agent and the editor won. <laughs> and it did make it a better story. I came to that conclusion eventually, but... I know that under certain circumstances, you're probably not dealing with agents on a, on a big basis, but certainly Tom, you probably have experience with this. Do you use the agent as a buffer sometimes? Um, in cases, yeah, where it's needed because the, the agent provides obviously a great level of um, mediation and support for their author. They are, we talked about editors being advocates, but agents are absolutely yeah. the advocate for the author and the advocate for the author to the publishing house, meaning to the editor. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we abs I absolutely leverage conversations with um, agents early in the process because uh, and oftentimes if I've never worked with a particular author before, um, getting a sense of, you know, know what a, a specific author's um, needs or their perspective is before I had a conversation with them. We usually start with me talking to the agent about them, um, about what they're trying to accomplish. But also if there is um, trouble or, or let's say that there's disagreement about um, certain things, usually it has usually been, at least from my experience, things not related necessarily to the creative process of like um, hashing out or, or developing the story, but for things like, say, like the book packaging and the cover, yep. which, uh, you know, uh -huh. at a larger publishing house, 
depending on the author, you may or may not have differing levels of, of influence, control, and ultimate say in what, say, the final packaging. I would say odds are, and I would think it would behoove most publishing houses and editorial teams to do this, to at least bring the author into that process. But an author may not have final say. And so a publishing team might say, hey, this is the cover we want to go with. We really love this. You know, like we think it works from the sales perspective, et cetera, et cetera. And an author might be like, oh gosh, I hate that so much. Um, and, you know, or I just, you know, I'm, I'm challenged by it or, you know, my, my, what I really envision as far as what I want to get across with is not this. And so I've certainly had some conversations about things like that with the agent where the agent is obviously the author has, has brought their concerns to the agent and the agent is bringing them because this is about a sort of negotiation about this part of the book mm -hmm. and the agent and I can have a conversation that gets at both the author's concerns and the sort of heart of what the author wants to accomplish and also allows like the the author can have let's say they have you were you were mentioning um elizabeth like this really visceral reaction you have to edits initially and how you it's like i put these out mm -hmm. it allows the author to have like a really visual like oh my gosh i really don't like that and a kind of really visceral reaction to it but not in a way that as we've been talking about like impacts the sort of professionalism that the author has mm -hmm. yeah. You know, um, and I would never begrudge an author for like, oh, I'm really unhappy about something like that. They use their agent to to bridge that gap between their frustrations and their venting to, okay, how do we then actually talk about this professionally and get to whatever compromise we're going to get? And in particularly something like that, having the agent is helpful because in a situation like that where ultimately maybe the author doesn't get final say, chances are you're still going to only end up at a compromise and the author yeah. may not be made, you know, fully satisfied there. Um, so yeah, I find it really helpful. Um, and particularly when it's an agent that I, I may have not worked with an author before, but if an a, if it's an agent that I have a pre-existing relationship with, because I've worked with them across some authors that can really help. It can help bridge that, that gap. It can help bridge that relationship. Um, when you're trying to develop that rapport with an author, or it's an issue that the two of you are at an impasse at, and you need that third person to help kind of translate for both of you, it's supremely helpful. Yeah. And that part of that is too, the, the agent is going to have an understanding of the contract that the author may lack. And so yeah. the agent will understand from the beginning of the conversation, if push comes to shove, who has final cut, who has final yeah. say. And mm -hmm. they can go back to the author and say, Contract says we get input, but we don't have final approval of that cover copy or cover art or whatever. Um, and they'll be able to tell the author in, in you know, blunt or consoling or whatever <laughs> kind of framework they need to tell them that no, we can't pick this hill because we will lose. And, and that has larger repercussions. And so they'll be able to then find a compromise that works within the confines of the contract as well. I have a well, really, have a, ex, sorry? No, go ahead. We're, we're pretty close to time, but please <laughs> add in, Gabriel. I haven't really had many interactions with agents, uh, just in a couple of anthologies where the agents were handling the short story sales, which is pretty rare, yeah. Um, yeah. but it happens. Um, but I have been in the situation where authors I've worked with in the past come to me and say, please help me phrase this so that I can tell my current editor that I'm uncomfortable with their edits uh, yep. without becoming, you know, without them perceiving me as a diva. Because that's yeah. the that's the four letter word for authors. You don't want to be perceived as a diva. Then nobody pays attention to anything you say. Uh, Amen. So, you know, how do I transfer my emotional feelings about this into a logical, reasonable argument that another editor would understand? And so I've been the mediator a lot in, in those circumstances, and I really enjoy that role because I get to help clients and help other editors who are at a tough spot. You know, publishing is a fascinating world. Um, but it works along the same lines as everybody else's. You have to be professional. You have to communicate. Try to meet deadlines, but explain when you can't. That's pretty much basically it. Um, I can't thank you enough, guys, for participating. Miss being at Gen Con with everybody, but 
at least we have this and the ability to talk for an hour. I just yeah. want to remind the audience that we want you to turn in your tickets for this event at GenCon.com so that the powers that be know that you are actually watching and participating so that hopefully we will be in Indianapolis at Gen Con Writing Symposium next year. Thanks so much, guys. You all take care. Thank, Thank you. you.